Welcome to A Matter of Perspective. I'm Judge Derwin Webb coming to you from the Fraser History Museum. I should be saying we're on the record today because I'm proud to introduce my friend, Judge Angela McCormick Bissett. Good afternoon, Judge. How are you today? Just fine, Judge Webb. How are you doing today? I I'm doing great, Judge. This Good. is it's an honor to have you on here because you don't know this, but I've been knowing you for a very long time. Now, of course, I followed your shoes at the University of Louisville, but right. uh, you are well known at the University of Louisville School of Law because I could not get through school without your outlines. <laughs> your outlines were legendary, so I, I knew about you well before I actually uh, had an opportunity to meet you. So I, I really appreciate you being on the show today. Well, thank you. That's funny. I remember in law school, I used to reduce every class to one page. I don't know mm -hmm. if that's what made it around, but just to one page, and then I would memorize that page for exams. So. Well, well, I got I through law school looking at your stuff, I will tell you that. <laughs> Josh, you know, we're, we're in different times, unprecedented times. Tell me, how, how do you feel being on the bench right now? You know, you're right when you say unprecedented times, and I think everybody in our community in their own silo is going through something they've never been through before. And... You know, when you're saying unprecedented times, of course there's the COVID pandemic that we're all dealing with, and the administration of justice has to go on. I mean, the right. things you do every day in family court are so important uh, for our families. The things we do in trying to enforce our laws are so important. And so we have to keep that going at a time when the world is stopping for this health issue. Right. Uh, then we have on top of that, it's a time in our community where I feel like we're going through an awakening. A lot of issues are being raised, not just here in Louisville, but all around the country with respect to racial justice, with respect to our justice institution, where you and I both work, right. uh, our policing, uh, our government, our institutional responses uh, to people of color. And so being here in the courthouse, we're, we're lucky because our courthouse is right in the middle of our community. We're across the street from our police station. Um, we're across the street from our Metro Hall, where our seat of government is. So we're really in the hub of this awakening that's going on. We've got the pandemic going on. Um, and I happen to be the chief judge right, right now. I was going to mention that. So I, my job has gone from, you know, being in the courtroom, hearing people listening to cases to a lot of administration just trying to figure out the best way that we can keep justice going. Right. And I, I will say professionally for me, uh, I've been on the bench 18 years now. It's hard mm -hmm. for me to believe sometimes um, that it's been that long. But just um, in the 18 years, this has really been the most challenging time for me. It's the right. time where I have felt the most personally you know, there's a lot of decisions that need to be made around the virus. What do you do if somebody tests positive for the virus and they're not staying home? What do you do with inmates who are being held on bond awaiting a trial and we can't bring enough jurors down to have a trial? What do you do with families who need decisions made about their children? And how do you do that in a way when you can't bring people together? Right. So it's It almost stressful. feels like we're at ground zero, too, yeah. being where we are, so... Yeah, it's stressful because we all want to get it right. Right. There's not a lot of precedent. I mean, when you look at when our community's gone through this sort of thing, I think the last time we've talked about is, is 1917, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so it's it's been stressful. It really has been. Um, I, I won't lie about that. Well, I'm, I'm going to get to some of those things in a minute, but let, let's go back for a second. Um, you mentioned that you've been on the bench for 18 years now, mm -hmm. and you have a pretty diverse background. Tell me what made you want to go to law school in the first place? You know, I went to school at the University of Louisville, where we both did, and I did at the time because I needed to work to, you know, pay my way through school. And I didn't, I didn't know when I started school, undergrad, for sure what I wanted to do. Uh, but I knew I liked all of the things that you needed to do to study then political science, which was what a lot of people did for pre-law. I think people are more diverse now in what they study. Mm -hmm. uh, but I liked reading. I liked writing. I liked, I, I've always had an interest in cultures and people of the world and the way things are done in other places. And um, really for me, I got into student government in college, and I was just interested in policy and working on those kind of issues and I thought at one point in my undergraduate career I really wanted to go into government meaning mm -hmm. I wanted to maybe run for political office so something more like a, a representative for the state or for the for the community and I had Dr. Paul Weber who's who's since left yes, us yes 
Um, and he was the pre-law advisor, and I had an eight o'clock, I used to call it his sunrise service, <laughs> course about the judicial process. Mm -hmm. And it was like a train hitting me because I was interested, like I said, in government and policy and, and what we did. I was a rabble rouser and a protester uh, back then. And I really, when we studied the Supreme Court and the judges and you looked at major things that had happened in our community, um, it was really through the judicial branch of government. I'm talking about cases like Brown versus Board of Education that desegregated schools mm -hmm. um, from Plessy versus Ferguson, even the Oberfeld case here mm -hmm. in more modern times. And, you know, our founders were so brilliant in having this three-part government because our legislature and our executive branch, they're out there in the open campaigning on issues. Right. The thing that really attracted me about being a judge is that as a judge, you're looking at the law, but you're not setting it. You're taking it and you're applying it to individual people in their lives and their problems. Mm -hmm. So you're the one really in the trench with the people. And although judges are less known by most members of our community, we're the ones that you're in your government, you're most likely going to have contact with. They're going to have an issue in their family and they're going to see Judge Webb. Uh, they're going to have a family member who, you know, has accused of violating the law or even, you know, a minor traffic infraction. And then they're going to be in front of a criminal judge. And those judges are the ones that apply to lo the law to them. And I really like the idea of being outside of, you know, that, that kind of vitriol that goes forward in poli partisan politics, mm -hmm. but yet being in a way of government where you're going to be applying law to people and helping get situations resolved. What I do on the civil portion of the docket that I sit on, where I'm applying the laws that we all decide govern us, you know, to, to corporations and organizations and and people with, uh, you know, legal disputes. I, I liked that. So I decided somewhere midway through undergrad, I really wanted to go to law school. And at the same time, I really thought I was interested in, in maybe being a judge one day. So both of those kind of came to me together. So you talked about uh, Dr. Weber, and yeah. Dr. Weber was a big influence. I think Dr. Weber was a big influence of, over anyone that was in political science because he made you want to do more. Do you have yeah. any other role models that you looked on, uh, looked to as you were trying to decide who you were going to become? You know that whole political science department at that time? I don't know if you went through. There was Phil Lemley oh, there. Oh, Dr. Lemley, yeah. Uh, there was Paul Weber there. Those folks, um, like you said, they, they not only inspired you to learn about government, they really did, not in a you know, not in a phony way, in a really real way, beat the drum of you owed something back to your community. Right. So you were looking at not just, you know, your career, but what, what you were going to do in community service. You know, I, I said earlier that I got involved in student government. A lot of that was Phil Limley. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I wanted to be behind the scenes working on things and had decided I wasn't going to run for student body president because I want to have to do this public speaking that came with that. You know, I just wanted to do the background stuff. And I remember he yanked me in his office. You know how Dr. Limley was. Uh -huh. He probably threw his jacket in the corner. And he basically gave me a push that I needed and said, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, what do you think you're going to learn just being a student or working on your grades that you can't learn if you try to get involved more in student government? Right. And, and it was great that he gave me those, that push. So that whole political science department at that time, I feel like was real a real inspiration for me and in, in that point in your life where you're trying to figure out you know who you are and what you want to do and where you can fit in and, and contribute i don't know if you felt the same way i, I did since we have similar pasts i, I, I those did guys. and I, i'll tell you this for me i know that i wanted to be a lawyer uh from the time i was about five years old but oh wow it See. was not until i actually came to the university of louisville and had a class with dr limley that yeah. made me know for sure that I wanted to do something in law. And same thing for Dr. Weber. Dr. Weber, I wrote a book, I have his book on my bench. So every time I go on the bench, he's out there with me, so Aww. so to speak. That's uh, nice. So, so that, that department really changed my life. It really uh, validated some things and actually made me see, see myself uh, a little bit differently after going through some of those courses, listening to them every day and, and, and figuring out what I was going to do based upon some of the suggestions and, and, and the pushing, as you say, that, that, they, that they gave me. So political science was a great place for me at the University of Louisville. And I suggest to any, any kid thinking yeah. about wanting Chuck to go to Chuck Ziegler, politics. he taught all about, you know, who, who was learning about Soviet 
policy back then. I remember Dr. Ferdo, we were learning about, I, I wish I could go back to that class. Uh, it was about Middle Eastern studies, but it, it really was a, gr a great place, mm -hmm. you know, to be and to kind of find yourself. Right. And, so, so you go from undergrad, so you decide to go to law school at, uh, mm -hmm. as planned, uh, and ob obviously you do well in law school. You get out of law school and you have to make a decision what type of law you're going to practice. What made you want to go to practice at Brown, Todd, and Haber? When I got out of law school, I, you know, I didn't know what the first legal job that I needed to have. I know I was tired of being broke all through college. I remember mm -hmm. sitting in law school, you know, because my parents had moved off to Florida. I was working. I worked for Bill McAnulty yeah. uh, as a law clerk. Yeah. made a whopping $5 an hour. I worked uh, for him as well <laughs> later on in life, too. So <laughs> we, have a, we have a similar path. And, and I was waiting tables on the weekends. Um, mm -hmm. And I had, fortunately, the reason I ended up at UofL again is I had a scholarship to law school so that was taken care of but just my living expenses and so I thought I need a job and I had a little bit of student loans again just for, to pay in for my apartment and mm -hmm. I really thought I, I want to start this legal career and I need to do something where I can make a little bit of money um, and I interviewed with some of the big firms I liked the idea that I'd be learning from good lawyers mm -hmm. and learning to write honing my writing skills. You know, we all have that moment, I'm sure you did too, mm -hmm. where you write your first papers in law school and you think you're a writer after undergrad and they get just, you know, the <laughs> yes. red pen goes crazy on your papers right. and you're shocked and you're hurt and then you say, okay, I've got to learn to be really organized and really precise in my writing. Um, so I really appreciated my time at the firm because it was those things I, I felt like I got to work on most. Mm -hmm. Some interesting cases, I got to learn business law, uh, insurance law, you know, all of those things touch on so much of even what I do now. Right. And I feel like the lawyers were really good lawyers that I right. trained with. Um, and somewhere about six, six and a half years into my law practice, I completely did a 180 and went into criminal law. Right, the county attorney's office. Yeah. Tell me about that experience. So I did that because I was starting to have my children and I thought if I'm going to run for a judge one day, I need a criminal law background and you know, you don't get that in a civil law firm. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the early days of the whole movement uh, regarding domestic violence in our community mm -hmm. and those cases being looked at differently that the dynamic between, you know, an offender and a victim in a regular criminal case and in a, a domestic case involving domestic violence and you know this in spades because oh, of yeah. <laughs> the work you do. <laughs> but. Um, it was the early days of handling that different. And Mike Conliff was then the county attorney and he put together this unit of specialized prosecutors and sent us around the country for training. We, we trained with some real gurus of domestic violence and, and how to handle those cases, how to prosecute the case without the cooperation of the victim. Um, and so I, I don't remember where, I, I remember I met with Mr. Um, uh, O'Connell, not O'Connell, Conliff, because I had told him I was interested in, in being a prosecutor, and he mentioned this whole idea of working in the domestic violence unit. And I right away did a lot of research on that and said mm -hmm. I would love to do that, um, and did that for about seven years. Okay. And really, really um, loved that work. Mm -hmm. I, I miss lawyering the most from, from that work, just working with victims and working with all the lawyers you do mm -hmm. and, and advocating. You know, we hang up that role as advocates, right. both of us. I've right. had you in my court before you were on the bench. And, you know, it's a different art advocating. It's much more active. And what we do now in terms of, you know, in, in the courtroom, we're listeners and, right. you know, assessors. Right. Um, so I, I miss that advocating role sometimes. Um, and, and like I said, when I, my time in the county attorney's office, I really did enjoy it. Now, having been a judge, I would do it differently. Mm -hmm. You know, that whole perspective thing. Right. I would handle it differently than I did. I think I was, I was pretty hard-nosed. Well, let me ask you this. Any notable cases as an assistant county attorney that you can talk about? Um, really just, for me, the whole area of how to prosecute domestic violence cases, um, was was the big deal the fact that just a few years prior if a victim had said i, I don't want to go forward you know the case was dropped mm -hmm. and the fact that we started now there now these no drop policies are back being looked at again but mm -hmm. but we really started we were part of the movement that swung the the pendulum in the other direction mm -hmm. so i don't really you know i can remember a few cases 
um, but not so much because they of notoriety, but just because of my work on those cases. Right. I can remember one time I had an individual approach me in my parking garage. I was pregnant with my second son, okay. and Judge Jeff Morris, who just left yeah, us just passed, yesterday, yes. you know, a moment for him, but um, he had just put the guy in jail, and he was out on some kind of community service and had approached me when I had gotten out of my car that day. Um, and I'll never forget that because I felt like I... I wanted to get in the courthouse and tell somebody this this guy had come up and kind of started asking me why I had done what I'd done on his case and I was did you feel threatened by I did. Him? Okay. okay I felt threatened and I wanted to get into the courthouse to get some help mm -hmm. but I didn't necessarily want the guy to know I was reporting him because I thought well if he could find me now he's gonna find me again and it was this you know aha moment you know my Oprah Winfrey aha moment where I realized oh that's why that's why victims act that way right. they want something to happen but they don't really want to be the cause of it so it was a real learning moment and I had a lot of those you know you think you go into working domestic violence cases and you're going to try to be the hero of of women or men who are victims that you help and it's not that cut and dry you right. know it's where you really start to learn those skills that you use as a judge that things aren't black and white there's so much gray you right. know there's so much gray area because it's a family dynamic because mm -hmm. a woman will you know do a lot to want to hold her family together she'll she'll go through a lot of you know whatever whether that's counseling whether that's and so sometimes they weren't happy you were prosecuting the mm -hmm. case uh, sometimes they were, but the whole dynamic of, of learning about that, I think, was critical just to my development, my human development and my legal development. Well, let's, let's talk about it a second about you being approached by this guy, because I know as a judge, I have been threatened uh, because of decisions I've had to make. Um, I can only imagine the same thing has happened for you, uh, especially as a prosecutor. Have you ever had someone threaten you or felt unsafe about some of the decisions that you've had to make? You know, it's interesting you ask that because, you know, I've, I've been a judge and, and sat and had trials on murder cases, murder for hire cases. I do think because of what I discussed earlier about as a lawyer, you're in that advocating role. You know, you're mm -hmm. saying, judge, hold this person accountable, you know, impose this punishment. I do feel like I, I felt more um, when I was a prosecutor mm -hmm. that people were you know, sometimes the sheriffs would say that guy said going in the jail he's going to get you or mm -hmm. you know and through APRIS and the Mary Byron Foundation they set up a victim notification where you can know if somebody's going to be released and so I would actually register as a prosecutor on some of the cases that I worked on mm -hmm. since I've been on the bench there's been some of that um, it's been limited but there's been some of that I you know our sheriff's department our Jefferson County Sheriff's Office that keeps you and right. I safe and all of our job. colleagues have reported to me some different threats or you know things from the jail from time to time um, but I say by and large I, I feel like we're safe doing our job mm -hmm. I feel like most people understand we're there doing a job um, so you know I, it's funny because I do a lot of work through our World Affairs Council, mm -hmm. and I have tried to go other places in the world and you know just see other judges. I think it's great to to learn what we do best, what they do best, right. to share practices and ideas. Right. And it's interesting to me how that that security component is top of mind for a lot of our colleagues around the world. Mm -hmm. A lot of them they will ask me a lot about our personal security and those issues and we're fortunate because I don't think when you you know when a group of us as judges get together and and we talk we talk about our cases we talk about lawyers you know but usually our security is not the first second or even third topic that we all talk about right. um, but but it's there thankfully. it's something because you're making thankfully right. yeah that's what I mean I think as a community it's one of those things you know, that we're struggling with now. You, you need community buy-in to your government system. People need to feel like if, you know, if they have a family issue, it's going to be handled fairly. If they have a, a criminal charge, that they're going to be treated fairly, that the law is going to be applied fairly. And when the community doesn't feel like that, there's a problem. Right. There's a problem. Because the community, by and large, now on any given case or any given situation, one half of everything we do is not going to win, right. so to speak. 
I mean, that's putting it, you know, too simply. But so, of course, there's going to be un people unhappy. And I understand that. And I don't even blame them. You know, we we don't get the crystal ball when we get our black robes. I right. wish we did. I we wish all we did, wish yeah. we did. We do our best to try to listen and get to the bottom and be fair. But again, you can't avoid that one side is maybe going to win and one side isn't so it's inevitable there's going to be people unhappy with you but the community by and large needs to feel like this is a fair system right and we have a responsibility to make sure it's a fair system right so you go from the county attorney's office you run for judge and obviously you win as a district court judge can you plan, explain to the people that may not understand the difference uh, between being a district court judge which you which you won uh, when you first got on the bench uh, between a district court judge and a circuit court judge and then you can chime in and do the family court judge part. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. Because <laughs> there's, you know, there's right, the district right. judges and the it, family judges and the circuit judges, right. and probably most people in the community just hear judge. And right. and what we all do is the same basic concept. And, mm -hmm. and like I said, you can fill the listeners in on the on the family court side. But so district court, I was there for ten years, mm -hmm. and I think it's a really important part of our court system because more people will have contact with the district court uh, than any of the rest of the courts probably. Uh, that's where you go if somebody dies and their will or their probate their affairs need to be put in order that's where all of our juvenile court hearings are held so anywhere anybody who's under the age of 18 unless you have a special kind of case called a youthful offender where you're treated as an adult those are all handled in our district court jurisdiction um, then you have um, all of the variety of, of traffic and misdemeanor cases that are handled in district court those are things that carry less than a year in jail as punishment so low, lower level domestic violence cases but i think those are important because you're meeting people right where you know they're not they're not shooting each other but they're having problems um, so i think how those are handled is critical you've got your dui cases that are handled um, you've got um, all of your smaller level civil cases. So where the mountain controversy is less than $5,000, you've got your eviction court, which is in the news a lot right now, mm -hmm. um, that's handled by the district court. So district court does a whole lot of specific jurisdiction things. And I think it's a really important court because they have a lot of involvement with the community. There's a lot of important decisions that are made there that really, I think, make a difference, especially if you can get people in the right community services and treatment before they get you know, to the more serious level. So then circuit court, where I am now, um, handles um, civil cases where the amount in controversy is more than 5,000. And we have a new pilot uh, business court going on right now that, that I'm working on. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then um, we handle criminal cases that are felony cases. And felony criminal cases really are just crimes that carry more than a year incarcerated as a punishment, all the way up to, you know, as you're aware, we still have the death penalty here in the state of Kentucky. Right. So all the way up to that. So circuit court is just a higher level offense for a criminal and a higher dollar amount in controversy for the civil. And then district court has also some more specific jurisdictions. They have a guardianship court too. If you have somebody in your family who can't handle their own affairs anymore, they're unable to, you know, maybe they're experiencing some dementia or they're, they're not able to make decisions about, you know, where to live or pay rent. If you need a family member that's gonna be appointed to help with that, you can go to the guardianship court and, and be appointed to help with those things. And that's something else important that district court does. When did you know it was time for you to make the leap from district court to circuit court? Well, you know, McAnulty, my good friend, Judge McAnulty, he was always a mentor of mine. And he, he told me after a few years in district, he said, you know, you ought to start looking to go to circuit. A um, little bit meatier issues, a whole lot more writing. And, and I'm a writer. I like to write. And so that's one of the reasons I was interested in it. Um, and part of it is just, you know, there's a, there's a book by the writer John Irving called A Prayer for Owen Meany. Um, it's one of those books that stayed with me my whole life because the character in there uh, is preparing himself the whole book to get somewhere and for me it was kind of an Owen Meany thing to to be a judge to begin with and then just to kind of keep trying to, to get to the next level and to see what what was there for me to work with and um, what, what kinds of things maybe would would come up that that I would feel like okay I'm well prepared to deal with this um, so it was really, but it was a long time. It was 10 years because so much of, 
you know, the other side of what we do that people don't realize is we have to get elected. Mm -hmm. And that's a timing thing. That's right. really a timing thing. You know, most of us don't want to run against somebody who's been there a long time. You want to wait for an opening. You've got to wait for an opening. And then um, I know uh, my good friend Brian Edwards and I were coming out of committee for the same seat. I didn't want to run against Judge Edwards. Mm -hmm. um, he's a good judge. I like him. Uh, so some of that's just, you know, waiting for the right timing. I think you, I remember, were interested in maybe being on the bench a few times before right, and so you, right. you you know i mean a little time before you actually started so you just kind of have to lay and wait for the right situation and the right race and you know none of us like to run against somebody we respect and admire exactly um, so well let me ask you this and without talking about future plans um how does it feel being a judge right now i know that you talk about always preparing for something next or the next step or i'm not talking about, i don't want to talk about the next step mm -hmm. i know where you are right now how, how, to, how do you feel right now being chief judge? Because I know you were the chief judge as, uh, in district court. Uh, now you're chief judge in circuit court. But like we said before, these are different times. How yeah. do you feel being the chief judge right now? Um, and we kind of talked about it a little bit, but. We did. The, like I said, it, for me, especially at the beginning of the whole pandemic, I, I was I was about feeling as high a level of stress as I feel about something. I've been on the bench a long time, so I have a process for deciding, you know, the important cases we do. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you don't take them home and stress about them. I do, but this whole, you know, being chief judge when this pandemic hit and and wanting to get it right in terms of how how are we what's okay about how we're going to process cases now and the jail you know you don't want the jail to become a hot spot for people testing positive nobody wants somebody charged with a crime to be you know in harm's way in terms of getting sick with a virus and yet the community also wants to feel safe mm -hmm. and so it's that balancing thing that we always have to do as judges you know there's the reason there's that lady yeah. standing there with the scales because you're balancing you know, I feel responsibility to keep my community safe, but you're balancing. I don't want anybody that's currently incarcerated to 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 meet their fate or you know even have huge problems because of this virus. Mm -hmm. So you know, we all went to work looking at the files we had, trying to release the people that we could safely, hold on to people that we felt like were a threat. Um, and th just those decisions alone were really hard. And then how do we hold court? You know, is it okay to have a, a defendant on the telephone or on a Skype screen? Um, I think judging and lawyering by and large is best done in person. You know, Agreed. we're weighing credibility of people, but we had to come up with another system. As you know, uh, you know, now you're, you're looking at the participants making really important decisions about right. whether they, you know, they, they are parents that are going to be able to be safe with their children or other things so I guess how I feel about it I can't say that I I, I can't say that I'm loving it because I I'm pretty um, stressed about it but I'm I feel like I'm trying my best to well, make these decisions the best that I can and I don't know and and get not, you know it's not just me I'm meeting every week with all of my colleagues mm -hmm. and you know they they've been great and we all just you know chew on all the various ways right now we're trying to really hard to get trials back up and running in a safe way mm -hmm. where we can bring in a jury panel have them socially distanced have masks you know, put exhibits on a screen where we're not passing papers. We just have to, we're looking at how other places are doing it. They've had a trial in federal court. And really all of us are involved in that. I don't mean to sound like it's, it's all on me at all. But ultimately, you know, they synthesize that and I try to push it out or I get right. the information. And, you know, as chief, you're kind of the information pusher both ways. Right. I guess the question I want to ask, because people have been asking me this, will the genie ever go back in the bottle? Yeah. Uh, will things ever get back to the way we used to be? Uh, I, I guess that's a question I want to ask you. Do you ever think? Do you think things will ever get back to normal, or is this going to be the new normal for an extended period of time? I do think, you know, all around the country and here in Kentucky, I think things will get back to normal. I don't think we're ever going to go to completely remote court, mm -hmm. but I do think that certain components of it will be more readily done remotely now that we've been through this and we've had to do it mm -hmm. 
you know, in the business court, sometimes we have cases involving corporations that are around the country, and they may want to have a client representative present at some stage of the proceeding, whereas before they would fly in, you know, get mm -hmm. a room, come and be in the courtroom. Uh, I would be open to having the conference line that I use now or the Skype line and allowing people to avoid that ex time and expense of travel um, and go ahead and, you know, appear remotely. Um, so I think, and, and our motion dockets, um, for, for non-lawyers, we all have a docket every week that's kind of a lightning fast call of setting things on cases. It's supposed to be lightning fast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that's pretty much okay done remotely because mm -hmm. we're not here in the meet, the real important stuff on those cases. We're setting dates and things. So I think we've learned a little bit about maybe some of what we do, we can take a little time and expense out for people. Mm -hmm. I think most of what we do though, I mean, most of the things you hear involving our families and most of the things I hear involving people's liberty interests and victims whose families have been uh, hurt or even the, you know, the civil cases, they are the most important things sometimes that's happened in that person's business life when they get to a point where they can't resolve it and they need a court system involved. And just most of those things I don't see doing remotely. Right. So that's why I say I think we'll get back to something that approximates the normal that we knew before the COVID virus. But I think hopefully the good side will be those things that are good will be able to, to carry forward. But I would rather, I know, see and hear people and be able to dialogue with people and let them know I'm listening and really hear from them and right. vice versa. I think it's just think it's more effective. Right. What, what do you think about that? I, I, you know, I love what we do now. Um, it's, it's a little bit tougher. Um, for example, for me, especially, for example, if I'm doing a, an emergency, emergency protective order docket, yeah. uh, where you have a whole host of people that are calling in or, uh, or appearing by Zoom, I think one of the biggest thing, one of the biggest challenges I have is just trying to figure out who is who because you'll have a person that would uh, that would sign in as iPhone 316 yes. or Motorola. So you have to go down and try and figure out who's who. Yeah. And then uh, trying to have a hearing with someone through Zoom that may not speak English uh, very well or yeah. needs an interpreter. Uh, those hearings last a lot longer when you have uh, people appearing through Zoom plus having the interpreter try and interpret what they're saying as well. So there are some challenges. Uh, I like to tell people all the time, I didn't create this situation. I, but my job is to try and make a situation the best I can better for a person or at least keep it a status quo so I'm not making it any worse. Yeah. Uh, so I believe that what we're trying to do now, uh, trying to accommodate people's needs. For example, I had a hearing last week uh, with two people in the Zoom, in the Zoom room. I had two people in the courtroom, I had a person on a cell phone, and I had a person on my landline. And we recorded everything to jabs. Don't uh, you feel like a conductor? Yeah, I feel you, like you an do. orchestra you conductor sometimes, because you have you to do. kind of tell when people can talk or they talk over the top. Right, yeah. and, and you just do the best job you can because you, you, you're trying to make people uh, feel comfortable with yeah. the decisions that you're making, also giving them an opportunity to, to be heard at the same time. So I, under, I understand, it, it, it's difficult, but we're trying to do the best we can just to make the situation best for everyone. Well, and you're, you know, one thing I'll say since I'm sitting here with you, I think you share something with me and that I, I've seen you and your demeanor is always, you know, win, lose, or draw, your demeanor, and as a lawyer, is, is one of respect. Respect for the system, respect for the people that come before you. And like I said, you might not be ruling for them. You might even think that they've done something inappropriate, but you, you come at this whole you know, uh, process that, that we both are part of with this attitude of everybody in it deserves to be treated with respect, everybody, whether you're doing what you need to be, whether you're not. You know, and, and I don't know, it, it, maybe some U of L and some, you know, just realizing that we're all better than the worst thing we do and that right. we're, we're entitled as part of a justice system to be treated by those in it with respect. Right. And I watch you do that as a lawyer and I know you do it as a judge and wow. getting out there in the community too. Well, I, I, I truly appreciate that. I, I would tell you It's that. true. I'm not just saying well, that. Well, I appreciate that. I, I learned some of those things you're talking about from Judge McAnulty. Yeah. He always talked about treating people with dignity and respect. Of course, I learned from my, from my parents first. Right. But hearing him talk about uh, fairness in court. 
and making sure that everyone has the right to be heard and, and making sure that you tell the story, always being prepared. All those different things I learned by listening to him and every day when I went in to um, be around him. So, uh, so I, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, and, and, you know, it's kind of funny you talk about me being in front of you. I was in front of you while you were on the district court bench, <laughs> on the circuit court bench. I always like to tell people uh, when I, I said I was in court, I always have to tell them, yeah, I, I was defending someone, not myself. I was defending <laughs> someone. But you have always been the, the type of judge that uh, I've always felt comfortable going in front of because no matter whether you ruled against me or ruled in my favor, I always felt like uh, my story was going to be heard and you treat me fairly and my client fairly. So I really appreciate that. I well, do have one, a uh, couple other questions I want to ask you real quick. Sure. Because one question that came out when someone heard that you were going to be my guest, they wanted to know what decisions, uh, how you determine whether someone got probation or not. So what, oh, are, the factors, really what are the factors that you consider uh, as far as probation? So just for your listeners, when somebody's found guilty or pleads guilty to a criminal offense, by law, there's a range of penalties. So let's just say, for example, uh, something carries one to five years. So mm -hmm. one year to jail up to five years in jail. You can say as a judge, you have to go to jail for a year or up to five years, or you can say you're going to have that one to five years probated. Um, and what probated means is you're going to remain in the community, you're going to report into an officer who regularly at some interval, and then they're going to you're going to be subjected to random drug tests. You might have to go to a certain kind of counseling. You might have to go to domestic violence, um, batter's intervention treatment. You might have to go to some kind of drug or substance abuse treatment. You might have to go to some mental health treatment. But, but probation means you're going to remain in the community supervised. So your question is, how does a judge say this person goes to jail and this person gets to remain in the community supervised. What things do we look at? And I think that's a really good question. It's a good question for the community to be aware of because obviously those two paths are really different. Mm -hmm. And so the law requires us to look at a couple of things. We're looking at whether or not they can safely be managed in the community. So a community safety prong. Do I as a judge think if, if we say they're gonna be probated that they're gonna do the things we ask them to do and get the treatment that they're gonna be asked to get and report into their officer where they might have to undergo drug and alcohol screens. So community safety, do I think that they're gonna be able to, to be maintained in the community but not you know cause a problem for any of our families or schools or institutions. We also look at a prong that's a little harder to get your brain around, but it's whether probating someone on this offense would unduly depreciate the nature of what they did. So even if I believe with all my heart, you know, somebody's remorseful and they're sorry and they're ready to do what they need to do to, to get on a better path, but, but whatever they did was just, you know, horrific. Um, you know, I, and I've had cases where somebody has maybe permanent vision loss or a victim, I mean, a crime victim, mm -hmm. something that's permanent for them or a family has lost someone. I tell you one of the toughest sentencing things are, are DUI homicides uh, because sometimes the person is so remorseful and says they didn't have the intent, although you know, you know, you get behind the wheel of a car and driving, but then you have this horrible outcome for a family. So you have two families, the offender's family and the victim's family, that are both torn apart. And those are just, you know, I always feel like I wish I had some other option because there's no good option there. Right. So you're looking at whether it would unduly depreciate the serious nature of the offense, uh, whether their likelihood what their likelihood is to reoffend, uh, whether we think that they can be safely managed in the community, and whether there's somebody that's going to do the things that they want to do that you want them to do to try to get on a better path. Uh, I can tell you, we look at their criminal history. You know, what, what, we all know the old thing our mom told, told us: the way you see how somebody's going to act is not by what they say, but what they do. Mm -hmm. So you look at: do they have a history of domestic violence? Do they have a history of? We get a report called a pre-sentence investigation that it contains a lot of this. So it has somebody's criminal history we can see. Now, the only thing we consider is what you've been convicted of. We don't consider charges that have been dismissed, but they, they have that. Then they have your employment. And, you know, just if you think about it, if you were making that decision, if somebody's out and in the community supporting themselves, supporting their family, 
and somebody who, for whatever reason, hasn't gotten to a place where they're working regularly, you might consider, are they somebody who's going to be able to be, you know, working and supporting themselves and their family? You might consider their education, you know, have they, have they been making an attempt to further their education? Um, all of those things are in, and then we get an ultimate kind of risk assessment that's data-driven, mm -hmm. and so it says, you know, you're, 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 it goes through a whole number of categories and it gives us a risk rating and we have all of that information before us and then we have of course the fine arguments of lawyers before us and in balancing all of that we reach a decision and if we decide to send somebody one little nice gatekeep we have is that you can grant them shock probation too mm -hmm. so you can send somebody that you think oh this would unduly depreciate what they did or this person just keeps offending and we, we're not getting their attention. You have a, a, a door somewhere between 90 and 180 days where you could also probate them later, not mm -hmm. on all offenses, not on uh, certain violent offenses you can't, but so you could maybe send them to send that message and then shock them out later. But okay. it's a tough, those are tough calls. Right, they are, and I'm glad I don't have to make that decision. <laughs> <laughs> I do have one last question for you. Sure. Uh, you as you stated before, you are in your 18th year, so you're, you're a stone throw, stone's throw away from 20 years on the bench. If you were to retire soon or somewhat, you know, after 20 years, how do you want people to remember you? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, just a couple of things I would want people to remember. I think the first thing to me is, is really what you already said, so I appreciate that. I would want people to think when they came in my court, they felt like I really listened to them and that I was respectful to them. Mm -hmm. You know, whether I did the right thing or not, it would really mean something to me if people thought that. So outside of that, that really basic thing, uh, I've tried to work on a restorative justice program in our court system. Um, and some people think, oh, restorative justice, that sounds really kumbaya, soft on crime. Uh, you know, you know, I'm a former prosecutor. Right. I think people want people held accountable when they violate the law, but I, I really strongly feel that restorative justice adds another angle to our criminal justice system that maybe allows for some growth for the offender and a lot of healing for the victim. Um, that maybe doesn't happen when we handle cases traditionally. So I think restorative justice is not to replace our criminal justice system, but I sure think it would be an awesome arrow to have in our quiver of how to deal with that in our communities. And I would like to have been, you know, one of the people that brought that early on and see it continue to grow and be used more and more, not just in our juvenile justice system where we're having it now, but with adult offenders as well. Because the best way to, you know, be tough on crime is to stop it from happening. And if you can help people to learn and grow as they come through our justice system and not just be punished, um, but really change, that would be a huge thing I would have liked to have been a part of as well. And, and, and lastly, you know, years ago I was working in a, uh, a Spanish immersion program for court. Um, I told you I have an interest in other places and worlds. Just may, maybe bringing some of that to just a real awareness that, um, you know, people, you know, here in America we have people from everywhere. You ask anybody, their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, you know, we all came from somewhere else. And just trying to bring that awareness that um, here in America, you know, we're accepting of other cultures in our justice system. We're going to make sure it's fair for you, regardless of where you come from or who you are. Um, that would be those would be my little, you know, ball of things I would hope to be remembered by. Well, you know, the great thing about you, I can honestly say this because I've been in front of you uh, as when you were on the district court bench, on the circuit court bench. Uh, I'm your your your. Uh, your mate next to you in, in the garage. So I see you every <laughs> That's day. That's right, Dermot and I you. park side by side every day. I try to get over so I don't block you getting out. <laughs> but but, but I'll, I'll tell you this, everything that you are saying that you want to be, people already know you for. Uh, you are one of the best judges I've been in front of. Oh, that uh, is so I, nice. I, I really appreciate what you bring to the bench every day. Uh, I look to you a lot of times without you even knowing uh, that I'm looking to you for your guidance, uh, and I, I truly believe that you, you you're, you're, you're awesome. I, I really, oh. I, I really appreciate what you've done for the bench, uh, for uh, our other colleagues, and uh, what you do for the community as well. Join us again for another Matter Perspective, where we'll come back next week with another interesting guest. Thank you. <laughs>